as if it were the centre of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Mem, I must ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my carafe and was still thirsty. Towards morning, I slept and was wakened by the continuous knocking at my door. So I guess I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika and a sort of porridge of maize flour, which they said was mamaliga, and eggplant stuffed with force meat, a very excellent dish which they called implatata. Mem, get recipe for this also. I had to hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before eight, or rather, it ought to have done. So, for after rushing to the station at seven-thirty, I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought they to be in China? All day long, we seemed to dawdle through a country which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on the top of steep hills, such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, which seemed from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be subject to great floods. It takes a lot of water and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like the peasants at home, or those I saw coming through France and Germany, with short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers, but others were very picturesque. The women looked pretty, except when you got near them, but they were very clumsy about the waist. They had all full white sleeves of some kind or other, and most of them had big belts, with a lot of strips of something fluttering from them, like the dresses in a ballet. But of course, there were petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were the Slovaks, who were more barbarian than the rest with their big cowboy hats, great baggy dirty white trousers, white linen shirts, and enormous heavy leather belts, nearly a foot wide, all studded over with brass nails. They wore high boots, with their trousers tucked into them, and had long black hair and heavy black moustaches. They are very picturesque, but do not look prepossessing. On the stage, they would be set down at once as some old oriental band of brigands. They are, however, I am told, very harmless and rather wanting in natural self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place. Being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads from it into Bukovina, it has had a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost 13,000 people, the casualties of war proper being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found, to my great delight, to be thoroughly old-fashioned, for of course I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress, white undergarment with a long double apron, front and back of coloured stuff fitting almost too tight for modesty. When I came close, she bowed and said, The her Englishman. Yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white shirt sleeves who had followed her to the door. He went, but immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome. 
glasses of this and nothing else. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat and I saw him talking to the landlady. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door came and listened and then looked at me, most of them pityingly. I could hear a lot of words, often repeated, queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd. So I quietly got my polyglot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say, they were not cheering to me, for amongst them were Ordog, dog Satan, Bokol, Hell, Strakoica, Witch, Frolock, and Vokosklag, both mean the same thing, one being Slovak and the other Serbian, for something that is either werewolf or vampire. Mem, I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the inn door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty, I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but on learning that I was English, he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man. But everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn yard and its crowd of picturesque figures, all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway, with its background of rich foliage of oleander and orange trees, in green tops clustered in the centre of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole front of the box seat, Gotza, they call them, cracked his big whip over his four small horses which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears in the beauty of the scene as we drove along, although had I known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw them off so easily. Before us lay a green sloping land full of forests and woods, with here and there steep hills crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses, the blank gable end to the road. There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit, blossom, apple, plum, pear, cherry, and as we drove by I could see the green grass under the trees spangling with the fallen petals. In and out amongst these green hills of what they call here the middle land ran the road, losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve, or was shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods, which here and there ran down the hillsides like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but still we seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand then what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Borgo Brund. I was told that this road is in summer time excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect, it is different from the general run of roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not to be kept in too good order. Of old, the hospitals would not repair them, lest the Turk should think that they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war which was always really a loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the middle land rose mighty slopes of forest up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling full upon them and bringing out all the glorious colours of this beautiful range, deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags, till these were them 
themselves lost in the distance, where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which, as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill and opened up the lofty snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look, Istensek, God's seat, and he crossed himself reverently. As we wound on our endless way, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to creep round us. This was emphasised by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset, and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed that Goita was painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn round as we approached, but seemed in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me, for instance, hayricks in the trees, and here and there were beautiful masses of weeping birch their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a litre wagon, the ordinary peasant's cart, with its long snake-like vertebra, calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this were sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their white and the Slovaks with their coloured sheepskins the latter carrying lance fashion over their long staves, with axe at end. As the evening fell, it began to get very cold, and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness, the gloom of the trees, oak, beech, and pine, though in the valleys which ran deep between the spurs of the hills, as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes, as the road was cut through, the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us, great masses of greyness, which here and there bestrewed the trees, produced a peculiarly weird and solemn effect which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies engendered earlier in the evening, when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds, which among the Carpathians seemed to wind ceaselessly through the valleys. Sometimes the hills were so steep that despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said, you must not walk here, the dogs are too fierce. And then he added, with what he evidently meant for grim pleasantry, for he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest, and you may have enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pause to light his lamps. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement amongst the passengers, and they kept speaking to him, one after the other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully with his long whip, and with wild cries of encouragement, urged them on to further exertions. Then, through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs, and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level, and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side, and to frown down upon us. 
houses of the coach by the light of the lamps and protected against it the figures of my late companions crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to his horses, and off they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill and a lonely feeling come over me, but a cloak was thrown over my shoulders and a rug across my knees, and the driver said in excellent German, The night is chill, mine heir, and my master the Count bade me take all care of you. There is a flask of Slivovitz, the plum brandy of the country, underneath the seat, if you should require it. I did not take any, but it was a comfort to know it was there all the same. I felt a little strangely, and not a little frightened. I think had there been any alternative, I should have taken it, instead of prosecuting that unknown night journey. The carriage went at a hard pace straight along. Then we made a complete turn and went along another straight road. It seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again, and so I took note of some salient point, and found that this was so. I would have liked to have asked the driver what this all meant, but I really feared to do so, for I thought that, placed as I was, any protest would have had no effect, in case there had been an intention to delay. By and by, however, as I was curious to know how time was passing, I struck a match, and by its flame looked at my watch. It was within a few minutes of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock, for I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long, agonised wailing, as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, till, borne on the wind, which now sighed softly through the pass, a wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country, as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. At the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear, but the driver spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down, but shivered and sweated as though after a runaway from sudden fright. Then, far off in the distance, from the mountains on each side of us began a louder and a sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected both the horses and myself in the same way for I was minded to jump from the clash and run, whilst they reared again and plunged madly, so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound, and the horses so far became quiet, that the driver was able to descend and to stand before them. He petted and soothed them, and whispered something in their ears, as I have heard of all stamers doing, and with extraordinary effect, for under his caresses they became quite manageable again, though they still trembled. The driver again took his seat, and shaking his reins, started off at a great pace. This time, after going to the far side of the pass, he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway, which ran sharply to the right. Soon we were hemmed in with trees, which in places arched right over the roadway, till we passed as through a tunnel, and again great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. There we were in shelter, we could hear the rising wind, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder, and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, though this grew fainter as we went on our way. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing round on us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid 
and the horses shared my fear. The driver, however, was not in the least disturbed. He kept turning his head to left and right, but I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He at once checked the horses, and jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do, the less as the howling of the wolves grew closer. But while I wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again, and without a word took his seat, and we resumed our journey. I think I must have fallen asleep, and kept dreaming of the incident, for it seemed to be repeated endlessly, and now looking back, it is like a sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near the road, that even in the darkness around us I could watch the driver's motions. He went rapidly to where the blue flame arose. It must have been very faint, for it did not seem to illumine the place around it at all, and gathering a few stones, formed them into some device. Once there appeared a strange optical effect. When he stood between me and the flame, he did not obstruct it, for I could see its ghostly flicker all the same. This startled me, but as the effect was only momentary, I took it that my eyes deceived me, straining through the darkness. Then, for a time, there were no blue flames, and we sped onwards through the gloom, with the howling of the wolves around us, as though they were following in a moving circle. At last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had yet gone, and during his absence the horses began to tremble worse than ever, and to snort and scream with fright. I could not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether. But just then, the moon, sailing through the black clouds, appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling, pine-clad rock, and by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long, sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them than even when they howled. For myself, I felt a sort of paralysis of fear. It is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true import. All at once the wolves began to howl as though the moonlight had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared, and looked helplessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see. But a living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had perforce to remain within it. I called to the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to break out through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the calèche hoping by the noise to scare the wolves from the side, so as to give him a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there I know not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound saw him stand in the roadway, as he swept his long arms, as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle, the wolves fell back and back further still. Just then, a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon, so that we were again in darkness. When I could see again, the driver was climbing into the clash, and the wolves disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny, that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept on our way now in almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon. We kept on ascending, with occasional periods of quick descent, but in the main always ascending. Suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light. 
and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the sky. Welcome. 
to my house, enter freely, go safely and leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not seen, that for a moment I doubted if it were not the same person to whom I was speaking. So to make sure, I said interrogatively, Count Dracula. He bowed in a courtly way as he replied, I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome Mr. Harker to my house. Come in, the night air is chill and you must need to eat and rest. As he was speaking, he put the lamp on a bracket on the wall and stepping out took my luggage. He had carried it in before I could forestall him. I protested, but he insisted. Nay, sir, you are my guest. It is late and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage and then up a great winding stair and along another great passage on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this he threw open a heavy door and I rejoiced to see within it a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper, and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs, freshly replenished, flamed and flared. The Count halted, putting down my bags, closed the door, and crossing the room, opened another door, which led into a small octagonal room, lit by a single lamp and seemingly without a window of any sort. Passing through this, he opened another door and motioned me to enter. It was a welcome sight, for here was a great bedroom, well lighted and warmed, with another log fire, also added to, but lately, for the top logs were fresh, which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney. The Count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew saying before he closed the door. You will need, after your journey, to refresh yourself by making your toilet. I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come into the other room, where you will find your supper prepared. The light and warmth and the Count's courteous welcome seem to have dissipated all my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered that I was half famished with hunger. So making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room. I found supper already laid out. My host, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against the stonework, made a graceful wave of his hand to the table and said, I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already, and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me to read. One passage of it at least gave me a thrill of pleasure. I must regret that an attack of gout, from which malady I am a constant sufferer, forbids absolutely any travelling on my part for some time to come. But I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute, one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man, full of energy and talent in his own way and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent, and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend on you when you will during his stay, and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of the dish, and I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. This with some cheese and a salad and a bottle of old Tokay, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating it, the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time, I had finished my 
supper, and by my host's desire had drawn up a chair by the fire, and begun to smoke a cigar which he offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I had now an opportunity of observing him, and found him of a very marked physiognomy. His face was a strong, a very strong aquiline, with a high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily around the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale, and at the tops extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong and the cheeks firm though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto I had noticed the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine. But seeing them now close to me, I could not but notice that they were rather coarse, broad, with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hers in the centre of the palm. The nails were long and fine and cut to a sharp point. As the Count leaned over me and his hands touched me, I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent for a while, and as I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed a strange stillness over everything, but as I listened, I heard as if, from down below, in the valley, the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon, so sleep well and dream well. With a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear. I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. 7th of May It is again early morning, but I have rested and enjoyed the last twenty-four hours. I slept till late in the day, and awoke of my own accord. When I had dressed myself, I went into the room where we had supped and found a cold breakfast laid out, with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the hearth. There was a card on the table, on which was written, I have to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. D. I set to an enjoyed hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell, so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are around me. The table service is of gold, and so beautifully wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas, and the hangings of my bed, are of the costliest and most beautiful fabric. 
bricks and must have been made of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten, but still, in none of the rooms is there a mirror. There is not even a toilet glass on my table, and I had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen a servant anywhere, or heard a sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. Some time after I had finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it breakfast or dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock when I had it. I looked about for something to read, for I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper, or even writing materials. So I opened another door in the room and found a sort of library. The door opposite mine I tried, but found locked. In the library I found, to my great delight, a vast number of English books, whose shelves full of them, and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers. A table in the centre was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. The books were of the most varied kind, history, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Army and Navy Lists, and it somehow gladdened my heart to see it, the Law List. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way and hoped that I had a good night's rest. Then he went on. I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These companions, and he laid his hand on some of the books, have been good friends to me, and for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Through them I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books. To you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. But Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate, but yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that. Did I move and speak in your London? None there are who would not know me for a stranger. That is not enough for me. Here I am, noble. I am a boyar. The common people know me, and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not, and to know not is to care not for. I am content I am like the rest, so that no man stops if he sees me, or pauses in his speaking if he hears my words. Ah, a stranger, I have been so long master, that I would be master still, or at least, that none other should be master of me. You come to me not alone as agent of my friend Peter Hawkins of Exeter, to tell me all about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest here with me a while, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation, and I would that you tell me when I make error, even of the smallest in my speaking. I am sorry that I had to be away so long today, but you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important affairs in hand. Of course I said all I could about being willing, and asked if I might come into that room when I chose, 
answered, yes, certainly, and added, you may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where of course you will not wish to go. There is reason that all things are as they are, and did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I said I was sure of this, and then he went on. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things there may be. This led to much conversation, and as it was evident that he wanted to talk, if only for talking's sake, I asked many questions regarding things that had already happened to me or come within my notice. Sometimes he sheared off the subject or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand, but generally he answered all I asked most frankly. Then as time went on and I had got somewhat bolder, I asked him of some of the strange things of the preceding night, as for instance, why the coachman went to the places where he had seen the blue flames. He then explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night in fact, when all evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway, a blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been hidden, he went on, in the region through which you came last night, there can be but little doubt, for it was the ground fought over for centuries by the Valachian, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a foot of soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots, or invaders. In the old days there were stirring times, when the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in hordes, and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women, the aged and the children too, and waited their coming on the rocks above the passes, that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant, he found but little, for whatever there was had been sheltered in the friendly soil. But how, said I, can it have remained so long undiscovered, when there is a sure index to it, if men will but take the trouble to look? The Count smiled, and as his lips ran back over his gums, the long, sharp, canine teeth showed out strangely. He answered, Because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Why, even the peasant that you tell me of, who marked the place of the flame, would not know where to look in daylight, even for his own work. Even you would not, I dare be sworn be able to find these places again. There you are right, I said. I know no more than the dead were even to look for them. Then we drifted into another matter. Come, he said at last, tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order, I heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room, and as I passed through, noticed that the table had been cleared and the lamp lit, for it was by this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa, reading of all things in the world, an English Bradshaw's guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything, and asked me a myriad questions about the 
remark this, he answered, Well, but, my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there, I shall be all alone, and my friend, Harker, Jonathan, nay, pardon me, I fall into my country's habit of putting your patronomic first. My friend, Jonathan Harker, will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be in Exeter, miles away, probably working at papers of the law with my other friend, Peter Hawkins. So, we went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Purfleet. When I had told him the facts and got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a letter with them ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place. I read to him the notes, which I had made at the time, and which I inscribe here. At Burfleet, on a by-road, I came across just such a place as seemed to be required, and where was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It was surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure, built of heavy stones, and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates are of heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, no doubt a corruption of the old Quatrefasse, as the house is four-sided, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains in all some twenty acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall above mentioned. There are many trees on it, which make it in places gloomy, and there is a deep, dark-looking pond or small lake, evidently fed by some springs, as the water is clear and flows away in a fur-sized stream. The house is very large, and of all periods back, I should say to medieval times, for one part is of stone immensely thick, with only a few windows high up, and heavily barred with iron. It looks like part of a keep, and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, as I had not the key of the door leading to it from the house. But I have taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house had been added to, but in a very straggling way, and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are but few houses close at hand, one being a very large house only recently added to, and formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day, and after all, how few days go to make up a century. I rejoice also that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvania nobles love not to think that our bones may lie amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety, nor mirth, nor the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters, which please the young and gay. I am no longer young, and my heart, through weary years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken. The shadows are many, and the wind breathes gold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow, and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. Somehow his words and his look did not seem to accord, or else it was that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine. Presently, with an excuse, he left me asking me to pull my papers together. He was some little time away, and I began to look at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, which I found opened naturally to England, as if that map had been much used. On looking at it, I found in certain places little rings marked, and on examining these, I noticed that one was near London on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated. The other two were Exeter and Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. It was the better part of an hour when the Count returned. Aha, he said, still at your books. Good, but you must not work always. Come, I am informed that your supper is ready. 
previous night and chatted whilst I ate. After supper I smoked, as on the last evening, and the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt that it was getting very late indeed, but I did not say anything, for I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. I was not sleepy, as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing that chill which comes over one at the coming of the dawn, which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who are near death die generally at the changed dawn or at the turn of the tide. Anyone who has, when tired, and died, as it were, to his post, experience this change in the atmosphere can well believe it. All at once we heard the crow of the cock coming up with preternatural shrillness through the clear morning air. Count Dracula jumping to his feet said, Why, there is the morning again. How remiss I am to let you stay up so long. You must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of England less interesting so that I may not forget how time flies by us. And with a curtly bow, he quickly left me. I went into my room and drew the curtains, but there was little to notice. My window opened into the courtyard. All I could see was the warm grey of quickening sky, so I pulled the curtains again and have written of this day. 8th of May I began to fear, as I wrote in this book, that I was getting too diffuse. But now I am glad that I went into detail from the first, for there is something so strange about this place and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I were safe out of it, or that I had never come. It may be that this strange night existence is telling on me, but would that, that were all. If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with, and he. I fear I am myself the only living soul within the place. Let me be prosaic so far as facts can be. It will help me to bear up, and imagination must not run riot with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving glass by the window, and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and heard the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting, I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time there could be no error, for the man was close to me, but I could see him over my shoulder. But there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it except myself. This was startling, and coming on the top of so many strange things, was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness which I always have when the Count is near. But at the instant I saw that the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin, I laid down the razor, turning as I did, so half round, to look for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demoniac fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe that he was ever there. Take care, he said, take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then seizing the shaving glass he went on, and this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's 
society away with it. And opening the window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless in my watch case or the bottom of the shaving pot, which is fortunately of metal. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared, but I could not find the Count anywhere, so I breakfasted alone. It is strange that as yet I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood, there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrific precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, which occasionally a deep rift, where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads, where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. But I am not in art to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place, save from the windows in the castle walls, is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I look back, after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life and began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only I am certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the fact. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits. And if the latter be so, I need, and shall need, all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there are no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door, laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these menial offices, surely it is proof that there is no one else in the castle. It must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did by only holding up his hand for silence? How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck, for it is 
is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing which I have been taught to regard with disfavour and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help. Is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself, or that it is a medium, a tangible help, in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort? Sometime, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight, he may talk of himself, if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history, and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. This is afterwards explained by saying that to a boyar, the pride of his house and name is his own pride, that their glory is his glory, that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, he always said, we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it, for to me it was the most fascinating. It seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke, and walked about the room pulling his great white moustache and grasping anything on which he laid his hands, as though he would crush it by main strength. One thing he said, which I shall put down as nearly all I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We, Sikeles, have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric tribe bore down from Iceland fighting spirit which Thor and Wodin gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, aye, and of Asia and Africa too, till the peoples thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying peoples held their veins ran the blood of those old witches who, expelled from Scythia, had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools, what devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud, that when the Magyar, the Lombard, the Avar, or the Turk, bought his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back. Is it strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, that the Hon for Glalas was completed there? The Sigelis were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and to us for centuries we was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land. I, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard, for as the Turks say, water sleeps and the enemy is sleepless. Who, more gladly than we throughout the four nations, received the bloody sword, or as its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king, when was redeemed that great shame of my nation, the shame of Gassava, when the flags of the Wallach and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent? Who was it but one of my own race, who, as Voivode crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed. Woe was it that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk, and brought the 
the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula, indeed, who inspired that other of his race, who in a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself. Bah, what good are peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without a brain and heart to conduct it? And when, after the battle of Moax, we threw off the Arncarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were amongst their leaders, for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Sigelis and the Dracula, as their heart's blood, their brains and their swords, can boast a record, but mushroom grows like the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of a dishonourable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is dull. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. Mem, this diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at cock crow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12th of May. Let me begin with facts, burr, meagre facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences, which will have to rest on my own observation, or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters, and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books, and simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examined in at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that a change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand, and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say, to banking, and another to look after shipping in case local help were needed in a place far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked to explain more fully, so that I might not by any chance mislead him. So he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now here, let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange, that I have sought the services of one so far off from London, instead of some one resident there. That my motive was that no local interest might be served, save my wish only, and as one of London residents might, perhaps, have some purpose of himself or friend to serve. I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labours should be only to my interest. Now suppose I, who have much of a furs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle, or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover. Might it not be that it could be with more ease be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency one for the other, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself. Is it not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by men of business, who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, he said, and then went on to ask about the means of making consignments, and the forms to be gone through, and of all 
and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to our friend Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then right now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder, write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much, nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is it not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself, and besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner, and if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of notepaper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign post, and looking at them, and at him, and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be more careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write shorthand, which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet, reading a book, whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring, as he wrote them, to some books on his table. Then he took up my two, and placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters, which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances I felt that I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number 7, The Crescent, Whitby. Another to Her Lutner, Varner. The third was to Coots and Co., London. And the fourth to Heron, Klopstock and Bill Ruth. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just had time to resume my book before the Count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table and stamped them carefully, and then turning to me said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. At the door he turned, and after a moment's pause, said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend, nay, let me warn you with all seriousness, that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old, and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now.
motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite understood. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing around me. Later, I endorsed the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, I went to my room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though it was to me, as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison, and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my nerve. I start at my own shadow, and am full of all sorts of horrible imaginings. God knows that there is ground for my terrible fear in this accursed place. I looked out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in soft yellow moonlight, till it was almost as light as day. In the soft light, the distant hills became melted, and the shadows in the valleys and gorges of velvety blackness. The mere beauty seemed to cheer me. There was peace and comfort in every breath I drew. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, and somewhat to my left, where I imagined, from the order of the rooms, that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mullioned, and though weather-worn was still complete, but it was evidently many a day since the case had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hands, which I had had so many opportunities of studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss, face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years, and by thus using every projection and inequality, move downwards with considerable speed just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? Or what manner of creature? Is it in the semblance of man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. 15th of May once more I have seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downwards in a sidelong way, some hundred feet down, and a good deal to the left. He vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared, I leaned out to try and see more, but without avail. The distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now and I thought to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared to do as yet. I went back to the room, and taking a lamp, tried all the doors. They were all locked, as I had expected, and the locks were comparatively new. But I went down the stone stairs to the hall, where I had entered originally. I found I could pull back the bolts easily enough, and unlock the great chains 
as though my own brain were unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end in its undoing, I turned to my diary for repose. The habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warning frightened me at the time. It frightens me more, not when I think of it, for in the future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear to doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary, and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleepy. The Count's warning came into my mind, but I took pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I determined not to return tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here, where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place, near the corner, so that as I lay I could look at the lovely view to east and south, and unthinking of and uncaring for the dust composed myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so, but I fear, for all that followed was startlingly real. So real that now sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, unchanged in any way since I came into it. I could see along the floor, in the brilliant moonlight, my own footsteps marked where I had disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them. They threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time and then whispered together. Two were dark and had high aquiline noses like the Count and great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with their pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with the great masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face, and to know it in connection with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at that moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of her voluptuous lips. There was something about that made me uneasy, some longing, and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain, but it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed such a silvery musical laugh as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable tingling sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, Go on, you are first, and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out from under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could 
Yes. <laughs> 
he would have taken or destroyed it. As I look round this room, although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. 18th of May. I have been down to look at that room again in daylight, for I must know the truth. When I got to the doorway at the top of the stairs, I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door is fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream, and must act on this surmise. 19th of May. I am surely in the toils. Last night the Count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done, and that I should start for home within a few days, another that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter, and the third that I had left the castle and arrived at Bistritz. I would fain have rebelled, but felt that in the present state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the Count, whilst I am so absolutely in his power, and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and to arouse his anger. He knows that I know too much, and that I must not live, lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur which will give me a chance to escape. I saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which was manifest when he hurled that fair woman from him. He explained to me that posts were few and uncertain, and that my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends and he assured me with so much impressiveness that he would countermand the later letters which would be held over at Bistritz until due time in case chance would admit of my prolonging my stay that to oppose him would have been to create new suspicion. I therefore pretended to fall in with his views and asked him what dates I should put on the letters. He calculated a minute, and then said, The first should be June 12, the second June 19, and the third June 29. I now know the span of my life. God help me. 28th of May. There is a chance of escape, or at any rate of being able to send word home. A band of Sagani have come to the castle, and are encamped in the courtyard. These are gypsies. I have notes of them in my book. They are peculiar to this part of the world, though allied to the ordinary gypsies all the world over. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania, who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves, as a rule, to some great noble or boyar, and call themselves by his name. They are fearless and without religion, save superstition, and they talk only their own varieties of the Romany tongue. I shall write some letters home, and shall try to get them to have them posted. I have already spoken to them through my window to begin acquaintanceship. They took their hats off, and made obeisance, and many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I have written the letters. Mina's is in shorthand, and I simply ask Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her, I have explained my situation, but without the horrors which I may only surmise. It would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, then the Count shall not yet know my secret or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters. I threw them through the bar 
bars of my window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back to the study and began to read as the count did not come in. I have written here. The count has come. He sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters, The Sagani has given me these, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall of course take care. See. He must have looked at it. One is from you and to my friend Peter Hawkins, the other. Here he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the envelope, and the dark look came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed. Well, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held the letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. Then he went on. The letter to Hawkins that I shall of course send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow, handed me a clean envelope. I could only redirect it, and hand it to him in silence. When he went out of the room, I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later, I went over and tried it, and the door was locked. When, an hour or two after, the Count came quietly into the room, his coming awakened me, for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure of talk tonight, since there are many labours to me, but you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room and went to bed, and, strange to say, slept without dreaming. Despair has its own calms. 31st of May this morning when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some papers and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket, so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again a surprise, again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my memoranda relating to railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact all that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. I sat and pondered a while, and then some thought occurred to me, and I made search of my portmanteau, and in the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had travelled was gone, and also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere. This looked like some new scheme of villainy. 17th of June this morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgelling my brains, I heard without a crackling of whips and pounding and scraping of horses' feet up the rocky path beyond the courtyard. With joy I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great litre wagons, each drawn by eight sturdy horses, and at the head of each burr a Slovak, with his wide hat great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin and high boots. They had also their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall, as I thought that way might be opened for them. Again a shock, my door was fastened on the outside. Then I ran to the window and cried to them, they looked up at me stupidly and pointed, but just then the head man of the Sagani came out, and seeing them pointing to my window, said something at which they laughed. Henceforth no effort of mine, no piteous cry or agonised entreaty would make them even look at me. They resolutely turned away. The litre wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope. These were evidently empty by the ease with which the Slovaks handled them, and by their resonance as they were roughly moved. When they 
shortly afterwards I heard the crackling of their whips die away in the distance. 24th of June. Last night the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out of the window which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there is something going on. The Sagani are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing work of some kind. I know it, for now and then I hear a far away muffled sound as of mattock and spade, and whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst travelling here, and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too. This then is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages, posting my own letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall by the local people be attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, and whilst I am shut up here, a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law, which is even a criminal's right and consolation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice that there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of the moonlight. They were like the tiniest grains of dust, and they whirled round and gathered in clusters in a nebulous sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing, and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure, in a more comfortable position, so that I could enjoy more fully the aerial gambling. Something made me start up, a low, piteous howling of dogs somewhere far below in the valley, which was hidden from my sight. Louder it seemed to ring in my ears, and the floating motes of dust to take new shapes to the sound, as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to awake to some call of my instincts. Nay, my very soul was struggling, and my half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker danced the dust. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me into the mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered, till they seemed to take dim phantom shapes, and then I started, broad awake and in full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes, which were becoming gradually materialised from the moonbeams, were those three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled, and felt somewhat safer in my own room where there was no moonlight, and where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed, and then there was silence, deep, awful silence, which chilled me. With a beating heart I tried the door, but I was locked in my prison, and could do nothing. I sat down and simply cried. As I sat, I heard a sound in the courtyard, without, the agonised cry of a woman. I rushed to the window, and throwing it up, peered between the bars. There, indeed, was a woman with dishevelled hair, holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against the corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace, 
Monster, give me my child. She threw herself on her knees and, raising up her hands, cried the same words in tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair and beat her breast and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally, she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh, metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before many minutes had passed, a pack of them poured like a pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance into the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long they streamed away singly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thing of night, gloom and fear? 25th of June No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and dear to his heart and I the morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort, whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it. Action. It has always been at night time that I have been molested or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake, that he may be awake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room, but there is no possible way. The door is always locked, no way for me. Yes, there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body has gone, why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should not I imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, it can only be death, and a man's death is not a calf's, and the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina, if I fail. Goodbye, my faithful friend and second father. Goodbye, all and last of all, Mina. Some day later, I have made the effort, and God helping me, I have come safely back to this room. I must put down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh, straight to the window on the south side, and at once got outside on this side. The stones are big and roughly cut and the mortar has by process of time been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down once so as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful depth would not overcome me, but after that kept my eyes away from it. I know pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window and made for it as well as I could, having regard to the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy, I suppose I was too excited, and the time seemed ridiculously short till I found myself standing on the window sill and trying to raise up the sash. I was filled with agitation, however, when I bent down and slid feet foremost in through the window. Then I looked around for the Count, but with surprise and gladness made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms, and was covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, 
so I asked him point blank, why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled, such a soft, smooth, diabolical smile, that I knew there was some trick behind its smoothness. He said, and your baggage? I do not care about it. I can send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said, with a sweet curtsy which made me rub my eyes, it seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart, for its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Though sad am I at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. With stately gravity, he with the lamp preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark! Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the rising of his hand, just as the music of a great orchestra seems to leap onto the pattern of the conductor. After a pause of a moment he proceeded in his stately way to the door drew back the ponderous bolts, unhooked the heavy chains, and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked all round, but could see no key of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without grew louder and angrier. Their red jaws, with champing teeth and their blunt clawed they leapt, came in through the opening door. I knew then that to struggle at this moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these, as at his command, I could do nothing. But still the door continued slowly to open, and only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly it struck me that this might be the moment and means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea, great enough for the Count, and as the last chance I cried out, Shut the door, I shall wait till morning, and I covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut, and the great bolts clanged and echoed through the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence we returned to the library, and after a minute or two I went to my own room. The last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me, with a red light of triumph in his eyes, and with a smile that Judas in hell might be proud of. When I was in my room, about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back, back to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait, have patience. Tonight is mine. Tomorrow night is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. It is then so near the end. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Lord, help me and those to whom I am dear. 30th of June these may be the last words I ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn, and when I woke, threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came he should find me ready. At last I felt that subtle change in the air, and knew that the morning had come. Then came the welcome cock crow, and I felt that I was safe. With a glad heart, I opened the door and ran down the hall. I had seen that the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness, I unhooked the chains and threw back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despair seized me. 
shook it till massive as it was it rattled in its casement I could see the bolt shut it had been locked after I left the count then a wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk and I determined then and there to scale the wall again and gain the count's room he might kill me but death now seemed the happier choice of evils without a pause I rushed up to the east window and scrambled down the wall as before into the count's room it was empty but that was as I expected I could not see a key anywhere but the heap of gold remained I went through the door in the corner and down the winding stair and along the dark passage to the old chapel I knew now well enough where to find the monster I sought the great box was in the same place close against the wall but the lid was laid on it not fastened down but with the nails ready in their places to be hammered home I knew I must reach the body for the key so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall and then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror there lay the count but looking as if his youth had been half restored for the white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron grey the cheeks were fuller and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath the mouth was redder than ever for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran down over the chin and neck even the deep burning eyes seemed set amongst swollen flesh for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated it seemed as if the whole awful creature were simply gorged with blood he lay like a filthy leech exhausted with his repletion I shuddered as I bent over to touch him and every sense in me revolted at the contact but I had to search or I was lost the coming night might see my own body a banquet in a similar war to those horrid three I felt all over the body but no sign could I find of the key then I stopped and looked at the count there was a mocking smile on the bloated face which seemed to drive me mad this was the being I was helping to transfer to London where perhaps for centuries to come he might amongst its teeming millions satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever widening circle of semi-demons to pattern on the helpless the very thought drove me mad a terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster there was no lethal weapon at hand but I seized a shovel which the workman had been using to fill the cases and lifting it I struck with the edge downward at the hateful face but as I did so the head turned and the eyes fell upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror the sight seemed to paralyze me and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face merely making a deep gash above the forehead the shovel fell from my hand across the box and as I pulled it away the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight the last glimpse I had was of the bloated face blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice which would have held its own in the nethermost hell I thought and thought what should be my next move but my brain seemed on fire and I waited with a despairing feeling growing over me as I waited I heard in the distance a gypsy song sung by merry voices coming closer and through their song the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips the Sigani and the Slovaks of whom the Count had spoken were coming with a last look around and at the box which contained the vile body I ran from the place and gained the Count's room determined to rush out at the moment the door 
wants of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on. I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once, after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving, Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were around me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending to me such a lover, such a husband and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary Kept in Phonograph 25th of May Ebb died in appetite today. Cannot eat, cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it, there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seem to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patience, as I would the mouth of hell. Mem, under what circumstances would I not avoid the bit of hell? Omnia, Romae, Venalia, Sunt, hell has its price. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards, accurately, so I had better commence to do so. Therefore, R. M. Renfield, aged 59, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man, probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armour for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a course, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident or a series of accidents can balance it. Letter Quincy P. Morris to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, 25th of May. My dear Art, we've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies and dressed one another's wounds after tying a landing at the Marquesas and drunk healths on the shore of Titicaca. There are many yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup and to drink our health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come, your 
I am afraid, a very sceptical person. 
say that they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating cured herrings and drinking tea and looking out to buy a cheap jet would creed aught. I wonder Marcel who be bothered telling lies to them, even the newspapers, which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up and said, I must gang again awards home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to cramble aboon the grease, for there be a many of em, and miss, I like belly timber surly by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying, as well as he could, down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town to the church. There are hundreds of them. I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out, visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. 1st of August I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend, and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fall in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed, and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it and put it down. It be all fool talk, lock, stock and barrel. That's what it be, and now tells. These bands and wafts and bow ghosts and bar guests and boggles and all and end them is only fit to set barns and dizzy women a belder in. They be now put air plebs. They and all grims and signs and warnings be all invented by parsons and Ilsenberg bodies and railway touters to scare and scunner halflings and to get folks to do something that they don't other inclined to. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that not content with printing lies on paper and preaching them out of pulpits, does want to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here, all around you, in what urge you will. All them steens, holding up their heads as well as they can out of their pride, is a cant, simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies wrote on them. Here lies the body, a uh, sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them, and yet, in nigh half of them, there been no bodies at all, and the memories of them been cured a pinch of snuff about, much less sacred. Lies all of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My cock, but it'll be a queer scounderment at the day of judgment, when they come tumbling up in their death socks, all duped together and trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they were. Some of them trimmling and dithering with their hands that dozened and 
say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, Doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. 11pm. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him a Zoophagus, life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind, did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause, I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain, congenitally? How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it shall be until the great recorder sums me up, and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend, whose happiness is yours, but I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If I could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend, there a good and selfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's Journal 26th of July. I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there is also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time, and was very concerned. But yesterday, Dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear, she is naturally anxious about Lucy, and she tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would get up in the night and dress
arch of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly coloured clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset colour, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses, not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the RA and RI walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his gobble, or his mule, as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbour till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers, which usually hug the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner, with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment, whilst she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce the sail in the face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea. As idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before ten o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleating of a sheep inland or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier with its lively French air was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and I, overhead, the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke, with a rapidity which, at the time, seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realise. The whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till, in a very few minutes, the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White crested waves beat madly on the level sands, and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept the lanthorns of the lighthouses, which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbour. The wind roared like thunder, and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet, or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire pier from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lighting, which came thick and fast, followed by such peals of thunder, that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea running mountains high through skywards with each wave, mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into 
sand and 
filled with 
this morning a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to Daytill Pier, was found dead in the roadway opposite its master's yard. It had been fighting and manifestly had had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away and its belly was slit open as if with a savage claw. Later, by the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to facts of missing men. The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold. 
Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not on the sea last night, but unlike. 
uneasy all the time and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that poor Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck being broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acute than other people do. Just now, she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I am myself very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry, nor heard the dog bark. During the service, the dog would not go its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently, and then harshly, and then angrily, but it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a fury, with its eyes savage, and all its hair bristling out like a cat's tail when puss is on the warpath. Finally, the man got too angry, and jumped down and kicked the dog, and then took it by the scruff of the neck, and half dragged and half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing began to tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effect. Lucy was full of pity too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in an agonised sort of way. I greatly fear that she is of too super-sensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I am sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude, tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads. The touching funeral, the dog, now furious and now in terror, will all afford material for her dreams. I think it will be best for her to go to bed, tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin Hood's Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking then. Same day. 11 o'clock p.m. Oh, but I am tired. If it were not that I had made my diary a duty, I should not open it tonight. We had a lovely walk. Lucy, after a while, was in gay spirits, owing, I think, to some dear cows who came nosing towards us in a field close to the lighthouse, and frightened out of us. I believe we forgot everything, except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean and give us a fresh start. We had a capital, severe tea at Robin Hood's Bay, in a sweet little old-fashioned inn, with a bow window right over the seaweed-covered rocks of the Strand. I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant. Bless them. Then we walked home with some, or rather, many stoppages to rest, and with our hearts full of a constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired, and we intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. 
as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steep steps to the pier and along by the fish market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead for not a soul did I see. I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came laboured as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint in my body were rusty. When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something long and black, bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, Lucy, Lucy and something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, the cloud had passed and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep and pulled the collar off her nightdress close around her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and drew the edges tight around her neck, for I dreaded lest she should get some deadly chill from the night air. Unclad as she was, I feared to wake her all at once. So, in order to have my hands free to help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety, and pinched or pricked her with it. For by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet, and then began very gently to wake her. At first, she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once. I shook her forcibly, till, finally, she opened her eyes and woke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as, of course, she did not realise all at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time when her body must have been chilled with cold, and her mind somewhat appalled at waking clad in a churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word, with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to insist upon my taking my shoes. Not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, where there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm, I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn on the other, so that as we went home, 
saw a man who seemed not quite sober passing along a street in front of us, but we hid in a door till he had disappeared up an opening such as there are here, steep little closes or wines as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud all the time, sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in, and had washed our feet, and had said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into bed, before falling asleep. She asked, even implored me not to say a word to anyone, even her mother, about her sleepwalking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health, and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and think, too, of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. Same day, noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her and seemed not to have changed her side. The adventure of the night does not seem to have harmed her. On the contrary, it has benefited her, for she looks better this morning than she has done for weeks. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her. Indeed, it might have been serious, for the skin of her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and have transfixed it, for there are two little red points like pinpricks, on, and on the band of her nightdress was a drop of blood. When I apologised, and was concerned about it. She laughed and petted me and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately, it cannot leave a scar, as it is so tiny. Same day, night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear and the sun bright, and there was a cool breeze. We took our lunch to Mulgrave Woods. Mrs. Weston rode driving by the road, and Lucy and I walking by the cliff path, and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself, for I could not now but feel how absolutely happy it would have been had Jonathan been with me. But there, I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled in the casino terrace, and heard some good music by Svor and and went to bed early. Lucy seems more restful than she has been for some time, and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the key, the same as before, though I do not expect any trouble tonight. 12th of August. My expectations were wrong, for twice during the night I was wakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed, even in her sleep, to be a little impatient at finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke with the dawn and heard the birds chirping outside of the window. Lucy woke too, and I was glad to see was even better than on the previous morning. All her old gaiety of manner seemed to have come back, and she came and snuggled beside me and told me all about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, 
Carter, 
Her mother rejoiced when she saw her. 
shifty look came into his eyes, which we always see when a madman has seized an idea, and with it the shifty movement of the head and back, which asylum attendants come to know so well. He became quite quiet, and went and sat on the edge of his bed, resignedly, and looked into space with lacklustre eyes. I thought I would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed, and tried to lead him to talk of his pets, a theme which had never failed to excite his attention. At first he made no reply, but at length said testily, Bother them all. I don't care a pin about them. What? I said. You don't mean to tell me you don't care about spiders. Spiders are present or his hobby, and the notebook is filling up with columns of small figures. To this he answered enigmatically. The bride, maidens, rejoice the eyes that wait for the coming of the bride. But when the bride draweth an eye, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. He would not explain himself, but remained obstinately seated on his bed all the time I remained with him. I am weary tonight and low in spirits. I cannot but think of Lucy and how different things might have been if I don't sleep at once. Chloral, the modern Morpheus. I must be careful not to let it grow into a habit. No, I shall take none tonight. I have thought of Lucy and I shall not dishonour her by mixing the two. If need be, tonight shall be sleepless. Later, glad I made the resolution, gladder that I kept to it. I had lain tossing about and had heard the clock strike only twice, when the night watchman came to me, sent up from the ward to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes and ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers. The attendant was waiting for me. He said he had seen him not ten minutes before, seemingly asleep in his bed, when he had looked through the observation trap in the door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and at once sent up for me. He was only in his night gear and cannot be far away. The attendants thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door. He is a bulky man and couldn't get through the window. I am thin, so, with his aid I got out, but feet foremost, and as we were only a few feet above ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me the patient had gone to the left, and had taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. I ran back at once, told the watchman to get three or four men immediately and follow me into the grounds of Carfax, in case our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself, and crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house I find him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing following a naked lunatic when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he did not take note of anything around him, and so ventured to draw nearer to him, the more so as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing him in. I heard him say, I am here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave. 
is a selfish old beggar anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes, even when he believes he is in a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, for he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before, and I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like his, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now at any rate. Jack Shepherd himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained and he's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are at times awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I shall be patient, master. It is coming, coming, coming. So I took the hint and came to. I was too excited sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. And that ends chapter 8 of Dracula. I shall be back with chapter 9 very soon. This has been Kate at the Library of Whispers saying,